I think you're going to see a bigger exodus of central banks, particularly in the emerging markets, the BRIC nations. I think they're going to accelerate their gold buying. In fact, as the price of gold moves higher and higher, they're going to have to spend more dollars to buy that gold. They have a lot of dollars on their books to get rid of and to replace with gold. So I think you're going to continue to see gold prices rise. At some point, investors are going to start buying gold too, competing with these central banks. So I think the trajectory of uh, the increase is going to accelerate. And that's, you know, the canary in the coal mine for the dollar. I think gold is the main competitor to the dollar as a reserve asset. Gold, as you know, I've been a gold bull for a long time. It's going up. Peter mentioned the central bank buying, and that that part of that is a de-dollarization story. But the real story is retail buying in China. This is all a China story, the gold, gold going up. It's, it's not really a central bank story. In a recent debate on de-dollarization and future monetary policy, Steve Henke, professor of applied economics at Johns Hopkins University, and Peter Schiff, chief market strategist of Euro-Pacific Asset Management, offered contrasting perspectives. Amidst the de-dollarization agenda, BRICS members India and Nigeria have agreed to conduct bilateral trade using local currencies rather than the U.S. dollar, signifying a shift away from dollar dominance. Peter Schiff foresees a decrease in the dollar's value and anticipates that central banks, especially those in emerging markets like the BRICS nations, will ramp up their gold purchases. Schiff posits that investors will also buy gold as gold prices increase, thereby contributing to further price escalation. BRICS aims to challenge U.S. dollar dominance in the global economy, kickstarting the de-dollarization agenda. Central banks actively diversify their reserves by accumulating substantial quantities of gold, diminishing their dependence on the dollar. This trend is contributing to record high gold prices. Contrary to Schiff's view, Steve Henke acknowledges the decline in the dollar's reserve status, but emphasizes its ongoing strength, nearing historic highs. He attributes the surge in gold prices to Chinese retail investors rather than central banks, suggesting that Chinese demand is a significant driver. While the People's Bank of China has been a major buyer of gold in recent years, the rapid rally of precious metals since mid-February may have tempered demand. Despite this, central banks' gold purchases continue influencing gold prices, signaling ongoing shifts in global monetary dynamics. Join us as we delve into Peter Schiff and Steve Henke's insights. To stay updated with our latest uploads, subscribe to our channel and activate notifications. Thank you. I think that regardless of what the Fed does, they should be hiking rates. Uh, they're more likely to reduce them somewhat. But I think regardless, long-term interest rates are going higher. Uh, bond yields will move up uh, because I do believe the dollar is going to roll over. Uh, and I think the, the selling pressure on treasuries is going to continue to mount, uh, not only from uh, the government trust funds, which are now big sellers like Social Security, you know, they have to sell treasuries because they don't collect enough taxes to cover the, 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 you know, the cost. But I think you're going to see a bigger exodus of central banks, particularly uh, in the emerging markets, the BRIC nations. Uh, I think they're going to accelerate their gold buying. In fact, as the price of gold moves higher and higher, they're going to have to spend more dollars to buy that gold. Uh, they have a lot of dollars on their books to get rid of uh, and to replace with gold. So I think you're going to continue to see gold prices rise. At some point, investors are going to start buying gold too, uh, competing with these central banks. So I think the trajectory of uh, the increase is going to accelerate. And that's, you know, the canary in the coal mine for the dollar. I think, you know, gold is the main competitor to the dollar as a reserve asset. And as gold prices really start to rise, you're basically seeing uh, the, the gold value of your dollar reserves plunge. That's going to put more pressure to de-dollarize. It's already there based on the sanctions, too, for, that we put on, on Russia. You have a political motivation, not just an economic motivation, to reduce your, uh, your reliance and dependence on the U.S. dollar. Uh, so I think the dollar is going down. I think bond yields are rising. I think the price of gold is going up. This is also going to be very problematic for the U.S. economy because higher interest rates and higher inflation are going to be a big problem that are going to exacerbate the severity of the next recession, which, of course, the Fed is going to try to fight by going back to its uh, monetary playbook of creating more inflation. Because you have to understand, the way the Fed fights recession is by creating inflation. That's what it does. You know, it, it creates inflation. But when you have an inflationary recession, when inflation is the cause of the recession, how are you going to fix that 
you know, with more inflation. It's it's not going to work. It's going to backfire. It's very close to its all time high on, on the weighted average. It's been very strong for quite some time. If you read the press and listen to what's in the press, all they talk about is de-dollarization and the fact that the reserve status of the dollar has been shrinking, which it has, by the way. The dollar remains up at the all-time high right now. I don't see any change in the near future for that. As far as gold, as you know, I've been a gold bull for a long time, and it's going up. Peter mentioned the central bank buying, and that that part of that is a de-dollarization story. But the real story is retail buying in China. This is all a China story, the gold, gold going up. It's, it's not really a central bank story. It's really, what is the cutting edge here? It, it is not non-Chinese retail, non-Chinese, non-central bank buying. That's actually gone down. The retail buying at the at the non-Chinese, non-central bank level is is muted now. It's it's if anything slightly on the weak side. Neutral yes. is slightly weak, but the Chinese buying on the retail non-central bank side has been extremely strong, and I think it will continue. As well, far the, as the, the Chinese, as the as Chinese the are smart. Deals, They're ahead of the curve. <laughs> Well, yeah, they, they, they might be. Peter Schiff argues that the Federal Reserve's decision to taper signals a return to quantitative easing, which he believes will be used to keep interest rates low, potentially leading to inflation. From 2008 to 2014, the Fed's balance sheet expanded from around $900 billion to over $4.5 trillion through multiple asset purchases. While some economists express concerns about inflation spiraling out of control due to the increase in the money supply, Others debated the effectiveness of QE during a period of low economic demand. Fed officials and supporters argue that QE stabilized the economy, boosted lending, and facilitated employment growth. However, critics view the policy as underwhelming, citing the slow U.S. recovery and its potential role in setting the stage for post-pandemic inflationary pressures. Concerns persist that the Fed's decision to taper its asset purchases has contributed to market instability leading to market turbulence known as taper tantrums. Following the end of QE purchases in 2014, the Fed began gradually shrinking its balance sheet in 2017 as the U.S. economy rebounded and unemployment declined. In response to the unsustainable deficit, Steve Henke proposes three potential solutions. Utilizing inflation tax, implementing direct taxation, or controlling government spending. While stressing the importance of addressing the deficit, Steve Henke refrains from making specific predictions about future monetary policy. Let's get back to the interview. The most recent announcement by the Fed that they're tapering their quantitative tightening program. Uh, they're going down from 95 billion a month to 60 billion. This is the first step in a return to quantitative easing because the Fed is going to have to choose between government defaulting on its obligations or slashing spending on Social Security, Medicare, government pensions, or monetizing that debt because there is no way that the government can finance it at current interest rates. The only way they can get interest rates down really is to go back to QE. They're gonna to have to start buying more government bonds to artificially suppress rates. And so inflation is gonna explode. I mean, those are the choices. We can have default and deflation or we can print and have massive inflation. But from a political perspective, I think that's the only viable choice that the Fed is going to make. And even if Powell didn't want to make it, he's going to be under tremendous pressure to make it uh, by the Biden administration or whatever administration, uh, even the Trump administration would, you know, they, you know, would, would, would do that. Nobody wants uh, to see, you know, government spending, you know, cut dramatically. Nobody wants the U.S. to have to honestly default on, on its debt. Could they and just so raise taxes, just Peter? Couldn't they, just raise ta couldn't they just raise taxes, Peter? On who? I mean, if they raise taxes on the rich who are already paying a tremendous amount of taxes, I don't know how much additional revenue they're likely to get. In fact, they may even lose revenue depending on how they do it. What we need is consumption based taxes uh, like a national sales tax or a higher payroll tax. But no one's going to vote for that. I mean, no one's going to tax the middle class and the middle class is already broke. Uh, people have no savings. They're maxed out on credit card debt uh, and they're working two or three jobs. How are you going to tell middle class voters that on top of all this pain, we're going to significantly raise your taxes? I mean, it's just, it just politically, it's a non-starter. 
So the, the, the path of least resistance is to print, right? And then they're going to blame the inflation on somebody else, right? Speculators, greedy businessmen, Putin, OPEC. I mean, they always point fingers because they've redefined inflation as rising prices. And so the government doesn't ri raise prices. They point to all the people who are raising prices and they blame them for the inflation. We can talk about possible scenarios, but I, I'm not in the crystal ball business. If we have an unsustainable deficit right now, any everyone concludes this, even the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office concludes, this is not sustainable. We, we cannot continue with the current structure that we have right now. So how do you change that? Well, one thing you can do is tax. And there are two ways to tax. You can have an inflation tax, and that would be by monetizing a big chunk of the debt. That's possible. And you can have direct taxes, where, where Peter and I get whacked with, with an increasing tax bill. And, and so, do, so do other uh, Americans. Uh, I'm in Puerto Rico, to... so I'm immune. <laughs> well, you, yeah, okay. Well, you've taken care of, you've taken care of, you're, you've been vaccinated. <laughs> so, 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 the, so the question is, what, what are they going to do? The deficit is not sustainable. Everyone agrees. They can tax to close the deficit. And, and that taxing will be either an inflation tax or increases in direct taxation. The other thing they could do is control government spending and put a cap on spending. So, so those are the only three possibilities. As BRICS nations aim to challenge U.S. dollar dominance and central banks diversify their reserves, the global monetary landscape undergoes significant shifts. However, uncertainties remain regarding the effectiveness of quantitative easing, the impact on inflation, and the strategies needed to address the unsustainable deficit. What strategies are necessary to address the deficit and ensure stability in the global economy? Share your perspective in the comment section. If the video resonates with you, join our community by subscribing to our channel and enabling notifications with the bell icon. Thank you for being a part of our community.